Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming today and for those of you who are watching online, thank you and welcome. So my name is Emerita Professor Lynn Abbott and it's my pleasure to be presenting the introductions for today on behalf of the, Institute, the UWA Institute of Agriculture and the, the director of that institute, Professor Kadenbot Sadiq. And he's currently overseas and so he's unable to be here today. Now, so I wish to acknowledge that the University of Western Australia is situated on Noongar land. The Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to practice their values, languages, beliefs and knowledge. So on behalf of the University of Western Australia, I warmly welcome you to this special lecture today to be delivered by Manoj Kumar Menon. <laughs> Did I get it right? Menon, sorry, <laughs> get it wrong. Um, and the topic is the umbrella of sustainable agriculture, agroecology, organic, natural farming, with a global and in Indian scenarios. So Manoj, it's great to welcome you, you. to um, Australia, to Western Australia, and I've been to visit him in his country, which was a fantastic visit. He's the Executive Director of the International Competence Centre for Organic Agriculture in India, Bengalur, Bengalore, Bangalore, I say, but yes. that's not the pronunciation. Um, so I COA works across 24 states in India and is associated with central and state governments. So it's a, a very big organisation in India and it leverages government schemes and it helps farmers to convert organic methods into their practices, especially focused on focusing on certification. This organisation provides training in organic farming methods such as on-farm inputs, crop production, natural pest control and disease control. So Manoj is a graduate of Agricultural Sciences and a State University Gold Medalist in, I can't say this word. Gujarat. I think. Gujarat. Okay. And he holds a postgraduate studies in business management from Delhi University. And he's worked on many agricultural and horticultural product projects across India and that have covered the last three dec decades. So welcome to Perth and to the University of Western Australia. And I'd like to welcome you to start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, here, yes. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you. Thanks a lot, Professor Lynn, Lynn Debert, um, whom I know f in the last six years when you first came travel to India for a, for a conference we were doing. Thank you all uh, people here from all different parts of uh, the world and also different faculties, I, I believe, not only from agriculture but also others. Um, and I am Manoj. Uh, I work uh, for a competence center. It's called the International Competence Center for Organic Agriculture. And is this working, I hope? Yep. Okay. And um, yeah. So I'll try to take you through a journey of, uh, of an umbrella of sustainable agriculture. You know, uh, sustainability, as we all know, is, is core to all that we are doing, not just in agriculture, but also in industries and all, all, all walks of life. But uh, when it comes to sustainable agriculture, uh, if, it, it depends where, which part of the world are you going and you will hear a different term there, you know, something all very closely related like a basket of offering. But you know, you have something called agri-ecology in Europe, they perhaps like this word and, and in the US, there's this new thing coming up called regenerative agriculture. I mean, the, it's not a new thing, but uh, it's, it's a new word that you hear, but I am also told that in, in Australia you also hear a lot about regenerative agriculture. Organic agriculture is also very related. We will try to first um, put these things together as to what is coming from where and how do you understand this. And then I will take you through a journey of what's happening globally in organic agriculture especially. 
uh, and then to India from where I, I come from. I once again thank all the people, uh, Dr. Siddhi Kadambot, who is traveling, is not going to be here today and perhaps this whole week, for giving me this opportunity. I'm absolutely thrilled to be in the University of Western Australia, in Australia, Perth, and I'm also told this, uh, this university is globally ranked very high. The agriculture here is the top in the Australia, in, in Australia, and it's really a proud moment for me to be here. Okay, so let us go a little way back so that we can come to the present. Uh, these are some interesting numbers to begin with. You know, uh, we are told that planet Earth was formed around uh, very recently, 4.5 billion years back. But uh, Homo sapiens, all of us, we started to, to exist in, in this planet only around 200,000 years back. Uh, and we all started from East Africa and then we are now all over the, all, all over the small planet. But uh, the Homo sapiens took another 100,000 years to reach Australia. So, Australia was inhabited only around 45,000 years back. Agriculture for the entire earth only started 12,000 years back, 12,000 to 15,000 years back, I mean something like that, that is the range. The industrial revolution started only 200 years back, more, even more interesting the green revolution agriculture, I mean the agriculture that we know today, the agriculture that has a lot of technology, fertilizers, pesticides, mechanizations, increasing productivity, etc. is very uh, just around 60 years back. And in 60 years, agriculture has traveled this distance that now we have to talk about sustainable agriculture already. The earth has been around 200,000 years, Homo sapiens has been 200,000 years back and 12,000 years for agriculture, 60 years of green revolution and we are now talking about sustainability. There must be a reason. There must be a reason that we have some, done something wonderful but also we might have slipped somewhere that we are so quickly talking about how do we sustain this. So that, that this is just the perspective to put so that you know, we know we have this time machine to travel up and back, um, back and forth. Okay, let us look at two, three forms of sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture is very, very simply defined by the, Uni by the United Nations FAO, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization and it defines it as the management and conservation of the natural resource base and the orientation of technological and institutional change in such a manner as to ensure the attainment and continued satisfaction of human needs for the present and future generations. So, whatever we can do to make sure that the present and the future both are taken care of is sustainable. Agri ecology is the application of ecological principles to agriculture systems and practices. Very simple. When I did my agriculture courses, a four year graduation program that we do in India, in 1994, 1989 to 94 that I did, we had no agri ecology, we just had agriculture. We had animal husbandry and we had a full fa facet of sciences under agriculture, not agri ecology. But agri-ecology has now started, especially in the last 8, 9, 10 years, where we talk that the application of ecological principles into agriculture is becoming important. Organic agriculture, again defined by FAO and also by uh, Codex Elementarius, it says that organic agriculture is a holistic production management system which promotes and enhances agro-ecosystem health, including biodiversity, biological cycles and soil biological activity. It emphasizes the use of management practices in preference to the use of off-farm inputs, in preference to the use of, that means more preference is for on-farm inputs. Uh, taking into account locally adopted system, so it has to be very as much possible as adapted to the local condition and therefore organic agriculture changes from one place to another the way it is practiced. And, uh, and where possible agronomic, biological and mechanical methods are all put together, but with the exclusion of synthetic chemicals or synthetic 
materials like fertilizers and pesticides. And when we say fertilizers, the, the, the connotations are industry produced fertilizers uh, opposed to what is called manures. You know, manures are that we produce on the farm like vermicompost, farmyard manure, etc. So, this is how organic agriculture is. Now, there is a new thing, not new again, but in India this has become quite a lot now is natural farming, which is a farming system which is coming from a very interesting book written by uh, Fukuoka, a, a Japanese philosopher and farmer, where uh, natural farming is almost like do nothing agriculture. How practical they are is in the today's context, etc., is, is being debated, but that is also something coming up. So, so we are seeing different words agroecology, organic farming, natural farming. I am not uh, yet touched uh, or defined at least um, this um, permaculture, for example. That is also another very important part of what is happening, especially in Australia and, and the regenerative ones. But I sometimes feel, uh, do not quote me, but sometimes I feel are we, are we putting the old wine in new bottles in, 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 <laughs> in different places. But because when I read all of them looks very similar even to me. But this is a very interesting you know, class of scientists, so it is I am just throwing this open for debate some other time. Okay. Now, let us also try to see sustainable agriculture in, in a, in a like, a, like a nutshell and what do we try to intervene with. So, we see this very three important boxes that we can tick. One that it must start with soil science. I also gather that today I am in the middle of a lot of soil scientists here. So, this is, <laughs> this is the important part. And you know, when the moment we talk about agriculture and farming, where do it start from? You go any part of the world, it has to start from soil. So, we can always ha put our hands up for soil scientists and you know, soil health. Uh, and, and, and also because, you know, uh, if you look back at 12,000 years of agriculture, there was once a soil that you put any seed, any plant material, and the soil had everything in it to sustain and grow. Today, it is a different scenario. But, but in organic agriculture, we talk a lot about soil carbon, not NPK regime, but soil carbon, that the test is for that, and the sustainable production systems. The second very important box to tick is the food has to be healthy. You see, the whole green revolution we all know has been a race to increase productivity. Because there were more stomachs to feed, the population in the last 150 years has increased much more than the first 200,000 years. So, the, this challenge was there and it has to be met by the scientists. But in this race to increase food, did we compromise the quality of food? Say for example, the food is an important part to keep us healthy. If the same food can make us sick, then is it really interesting to make it only more and more production? We should we not look at the quality. So, the chemical farming or the green revolution farming has given us a lot of residues in the crop, in the food, in the soil and that can be avoided using sustainable farming system or organic farming system. The third very important box without which none of this will exist are the farmers themselves. If the farmers are not interested to take up whatever terms that we are throwing here, it is not going to be sustainable because they are not going to take it up. So, for farmers, it is very important that their economics are taken care of. The cost of cultivation with each and new uh, you know, uh, technologies coming in, if they are not able to make more money out of it, finally, it is also not going to be very interesting. How many farmers will really be interested to see that the climate change mitigation is happening? Climate change, of course, is important for everyone, but for an individual farmer, I mean, in a farmer in India who has got one acre or two acre, and I go and talk to them. See, in the recent NOP in Geneva, COP in Geneva, there is this. You know, we have to reduce two percentage uh, <laughs> or two percent, two uh, degree uh, in the last uh, in the next eighteen years. Otherwise, the earth is going to be flooded. And the farmer will say, "No, no, give me a break. How do I send my kids to school? Tell me, how do I sustain my life?" How do I make for money? I mean, some some money uh, so that I can put in the bank and see that my future is secure. So, farmers' economics cannot be 
ignored by any kind of technology that we are talking about. So, in the 1980s, at least in, 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 in Europe and, and also in part, uh, parts of India, this concern towards sustainable agriculture started somewhere in the 1980s. Because from 1960s, Green Revolution kicked in and then in 20 years already farmers were starting to see that something is not going really right. Either the soil level or their own health level or, uh, or infertility or productivity level. And then therefore, there were these two groups of farmers that started to emerge. One are the farmers who started to really look at sustainability as a concern and second were a group who said there is also an opportunity to you know to tap into a new market. And this market is you know uh, certified organic for example gives you a premium of 20 percent, 15 percent, 25 percentage over and above the markets. But there is also a convergence farmers who looked at both of this as an important part. For example, in a country like India, 74 percentage of the farmers are very small and marginal. Uh, we, we call them small farmers when their <coughs> land holdings are less than 10 acres. For Australia, it may be very new because I think you have farmers of 100 acres, 200 acres, 500 acres. But in India, 2 acres, 4 acres, 5 acres, 10 acres are, are around 74 percent of the farmers. Okay. And then in, the, in those uh, 1980s and 1990s, there, there was this interesting uh, increase in organic farming, organic markets. And you know what? In the last two decades or, or a maximum three decades, the world is now seeing 76 million hectares under certified organic farming across the world. 3.7 million farmers have switched on and 135 billion US dollars are, uh, are the size or the, or, the, or the market. Yes. So, hope your phone has not crashed or something. You are all right? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. You please keep it sustainable. <laughs> okay. So, now, yeah. So, these are the number of countries uh, in organic farming already. 191 countries are, are in organic farming, certified organic. Uh, the 74 of them have their own regulations in place. Also, Australia, global organic share in total agri lands is 1.6 percentage, very small, 1.6. But some of the countries in Europe are now around 13 percentage, 14 percentage also, but in, on an average only 1.6. There is another alternative to organic certification because organic certification is also, you know, the moment I throw this, that is the elephant in the room. Oh, the certification you know, is too much, you know, it is very regulatory, it is very expensive. So, there is another very easier method for the farmers to do, it is called participatory guarantee system. This is also recognized by IFO, the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements. And the biggest market continues to be the US with 52 billion uh, US dollar size of market. This is about the organization that I come from, just two or three slides to introduce my organization. It is called the International Competence Center for Organic Agriculture, the name being too long. We keep it very short and call it ECOA and it is an organization that works very closely between the farmers and the governments and, and the stakeholders who connects them. So, we are like a platform, a, a networking organization that helps connect. So, we do a little bit of advocacy, popularizing organic agriculture in the country. We also organize India's biggest organic trade fair and conference program in which on one of the program we had the, the pleasure to have uh, Dr. Lin speaking. And, and in the last 19 years that this organization uh, is around, we have worked with 198,000 farmers helping them convert from conventional farming system into organic farming systems. Uh, and uh, in the process, uh, we have converted 129,000 hectares to, to this, this process, which I feel is, 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 is a number that is, you know, because at least that much of chemical load we have decreased uh, in those areas. We work very closely with some of the international organization like FIBL, uh, Research Institute in Switzerland, very well known for the research in organic and sustainable farming systems. Uh, FAO, like I said uh, a little before, GIZ of Germany. We have a joint venture for doing this international trade fair that I spoke about, which is a company called uh, Nuremberg Messe in, in Germany, and the fair is called BioFact. 
maybe some of you would have visited or, or heard of this fair which happens every February in January. It is almost like a mecca of organic farming. You see and uh, go to this place and you will be absolutely surprised by the number of producers and farmers and countries who are engaged in this system of farming. Okay. Coming back to, oh, do, would you, we have time maybe for a small video, the organization that I come from has a very small organic farm uh, just outside of Bangalore. So, it is an organic farm, a very small farm just outside of Bangalore as I was telling and if any of you visit India, you are welcome to. Welcome to JVK, the Jaivik Vigyan Kendra. This organic farm center is initiated and developed by ECOVA, the International Competence Center for Organic Agriculture. JBK is being developed as an organic farm on the concepts of sustainable bio-village. The aim is to make it an institute for demonstration and training for all sections of organic and natural stakeholders. From farmers, FPOs, rural entrepreneurs, companies, government departments and agencies. JVK is located near Salivaram village of Dankini Kota, Kushtaburi district of Tamil Nadu. It is less than two hours drive from Bangalore. The making of JVK. ECOA as a non-profit organization is a knowledge center for organic farming. Working across the country with over 200,000 farmers since 2004. ECOWAS farm and its development as JVK is in line with ECOWAS mandate. The building and infrastructure at JVK also follows the principles of sustainability. Every structure was designed and made with minimal impact to the environment. For example, the bricks are made from the soil of the farm using the technology of soil compressed blocks which do not use fire, energy and uses minimal cement. And the pit from soil excavation becomes a farm pond and is used for rainwater harvesting. JVK embodies the concept of sustainable bio-village which integrates seven different yet interconnected components namely agriculture, horticulture, animal husbandry, organic inputs, clean energy, processing, rural entrepreneurship and agri-ecotourism. Organic agriculture, as you all know today, not only excludes the use of synthetic products, fertilizers, pesticides, hormones, etc., but also follows the principles and practices of sustainable agriculture and sustainability as a whole. ECOWAS JVK is a demo model plus training center plus a weekly getaway for urban farmers and organic enthusiasts. It has a training hall with projectors and screens for workshops. The guest rooms can accommodate 16 to 20 people. Families already come and stay and experience natural and organic farming. One can stay here for a retreat. Take a trek into the nearby hills and forests, eat good, healthy food cooked in its kitchen, sitting around a bonfire and barbecue if you like. JVK provides training on natural and organic farming and also conducts workshops for rural and urban entrepreneurs and farmer producer organizations for the CEOs and board members. JVK envisions to be an institute serving the natural and organic farming comprehensively. Welcome to JVK, Jaivik Vigyan Kendra. Yeah, so Jaivik, the Jaivik Vigyan Kendra word is a Sanskrit word loosely translated as a center for sustainable and organic farming. Yes, so we were here back to how the world's organic agriculture scenario looks like. We now know that the world globally we have 76 million hectares. Australia has 35 million hectares. In fact, Australia is the largest country which has certified organic areas. It is a different thing that a large area is under pastures 
uh, not really into crops, but the area definitely is certified organic. And 1.6 uh, percentage, but if you look at some of the countries like Liechtenstein, 40 percentage, Austria, 26 percentage. So some of these countries have very good percentage of land under organic. And the growth is also beautiful. I mean, if some of you want to be a business entrepreneur in, in, in agriculture, this is also a good, great opportunity. The organic has, has very good demand and that's also. So uh, yeah, a few more data if you like. 3.7 million farmers. In fact, India has the largest number of farmers. While Australia has the largest area, India has the largest number of farmers, followed by Uganda, Ethiopia, and there in area, Australia is followed by Argentina and France. And in terms of market size, these are the countries, etc. Now, if you see, everything is av today available organically. Any product that you may choose from fruits to vegetables to spices to cereals, etc. So it's it's a it's a technology that is that fits and, and, and it's working also very well. The top ten countries. Okay. So now the moment we talk about organic agriculture, the most important question that the scientific community would ask, of course, is can it can it feed the world? Because today uh, the world has Correct me if I am wrong, 7.5 billion is the world population, yeah, and, uh, and it is growing. But uh, you know, scientists also say that if you look at the number, the total food production in the world today can actually feed 10 billion population, and the population is 7.5. So it is actually not a question of production, it is more a question of distribution. So food scarcity or hunger cannot be solved only by increasing production or productivity, but productivity is one thing and distribution of food all over the world is another thing. So are we barking up the wrong tree sometimes when you only talk about getting more food per acre. But it also proves that small scale sustainable farming can also even double food production. Many areas in the world which have rain fed, irrigation is not there. Uh, many scientists feel that use of chemical farming and mechanized farming is not going to be very helpful. So other sustainable forms can also increase production and it can also help in for example in parts of the world where food is not there. There can be technologies where these communities can produce for themselves. Maybe everybody is going after wheat and rice production where there are more alternative things to feed yourself with. I will come to a very interesting uh, thing about that in the end. What is the next, uh, what is the other alternative foods available? Uh, but you see, um, these are some of the scientific reports also from a lot of research. We know about CGIAR, the Consultative Group for in, uh, International Agriculture Research. That report also speaks a lot about these things. So it is not just you know, uh, some kind of a niche or some people talking about it, but there is a lot of scientific community also involved. Now coming to India a little bit. India started its structured organic agricultures in 2001 when India started to have what is called a national program of organic production, its own regulations and very soon in the next 10 years India had th has already 33 accredited certification agencies which certifies organic farming uh, and in all these uh, walks, crop production, livestock, apiculture, aquaculture and, and food processing. And already India has 4.3 million hectares under certified uh, area. Uh, and this is the cultivated, uh, I mean this is including uh, also wild areas. Just the cultivated land is uh, 2.65 million and uh, 1.5 million farmers are certified organic, etc., etc. So there is a lot of development there. And I was mentioning there are two kinds of certification, one is the third party. And the another method which is easier for farmers to do is participatory guarantee systems. Do you have any questions to ask me or are you, I am just talking at, or would, uh, should I take it only at the end of the? Yes. Yes. And this is how the area have been increasing. So you can see quite steady increase. Sometimes a dip, for example, the dip is also coming from whenever there was genetically modified seeds or plants used. GM seeds are not allowed 
and in some part of the of the country like in the central india there have been use of gm seeds and that uh, that causes this dip because those land will, ha will have to be taken out of the organic farming systems so these are the various organic uh, certification system the national program the eu certification the usda is the us certification etc okay now we also talk a lot about how organic farming system really works and what are the important parameters to 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 be in organic farming or even other sustainable farming system one is that we should go for region specific crops but also rotations solo cropping or mono cropping is a big no in organic farming and also other sustainable farming systems it has to be diversified and mixed farming that means animal is also a very important part of of this kind of a farming system agroforestry is very important and we must also always talk about soil organic carbon rather than the npk and the 2021 20, nutrients in the soil so there, there is this very interesting number if you see for every 0.1 percentage increase in soc the land can sequester 3500 to 4500 kgs of co2 equivalent per acre um, Dr. Well, we were just, just talking about soil sequestration, that one of your project. And we say that in organic farming, the soil, the land works as a carbon sink. While in conventional agriculture, agriculture uh, farming is a culprit because it re releases CO2. In organic farming, it is the reverse. The land can, be, can become a, soil, uh, a carbon sink and with every 0.1 percentage improvement in SOC, the land can sequester something like 4,000 kg CO2 per acre, which is a very important part of how um, uh, you know climate change mitigation can also be triggered. And the other important challenge in agriculture is always the water use efficiency. So here we see that with a, with a land with 0.5 percentage SOM soil organic matter, it can it can you know what do you call hold 80,000 liters per acre and with every 0.5 percentage uh, improvement in soil organic matter we can see how the water holding capacity of the soil improves and which is a very important part especially in rain fed farming and, and uh, dry farming uh, areas. For example uh, like this morning uh, afternoon we were talking about Australia being a almost a completely dry farming rain fed uh, agriculture system. Now we come to the last part of this presentation and I introduced to you a category of foods and uh, which is a very important alternative, very conducive and very good for uh, sustainable farming systems and how many of us have heard about millets? Good, good part of us have heard of millets. How many of you have ever tried millets in your food? That is also a good number. Great. And all of us definitely know that this is the International Year of Millets 2023, right? The FAO United Nations has declared 2023 as the International Year of Millets. So I do not want to miss uh, introducing this. And in fact, the International Year of Millets came about, I will come to this story a little later, but this is the kind of areas under millets. And let me tell you, these areas were 10 times higher before the green revolution agriculture at least 10 times higher it has become one tenth or lesser in the last 60 years across africa across asia across all parts of the world <coughs> africa continues to have the largest area under millets you look at the production and if this is one tenth you can also imagine how much of the food opportunities were lost in that continent in the last 60 years because they were all eating millets as the staple food. America's Asia is another as I said uh, large. India continues actually to be a leader in the production of millets. India produces 170 lakh tons or 17 million tons uh, of millets. The global average is 1229. India has 1239 kg per hectare, very, very close, but there is a huge, I mean, this is, this is the challenge. The, the moment you talk about millets, we talk that the productivity is, is quite low and there is a lot of work 
needed to be done there. But this, see, in, in my country, this is the map of my small country, of course, uh, smaller than Australia, but larger than <laughs> good number of countries. Uh, so we have this millets in almost every part of the, of the country. Uh, I did my agriculture from Gujarat, you were, you know, trying to do. Why I, we, uh, you know, we would like to mention Gujarat a little bit more. Why? Because our Prime Minister is from Gujarat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Narendra Modi ji is from Gujarat. Well, let us, you know, <laughs> also mention a little more. Anyway, so the earliest evidence of millets were found in the Indus civilization 3000 BC. That means around 5000 years before. And it was grown or is still grown in 131 countries. It's an ancient food grain. It was a staple food of most of the human. And it's a, actually a collective group of small seeded annual grasses. In fact, this whole millet, the International Year of Millet started off by a program that we started in Karnataka, the, the, the state that I work in now. Uh, and then uh, the, the, that time the Agriculture Minister of Karnataka, Sri Krishna Bhairya Goda, he travelled to FAO Rome and made a presentation. And in that presentation he pitched about the importance of millets and uh, requested FAO can something like International Year be. So just see this, that program, this was first conducted in 2017, but you will get some glimpses of how uh, it, it may be. <laughs> Climate smart. Turn to organics. Organic produce has higher value realization. A fresh argument and awareness had to be created to spread a movement. Let's mill it, go organic. One bold step for an idea that's good for the farmer, good for the planet and good for us. Then an even bolder idea. Turning the focus from superfoods to next-gen smartfoods. The world of organics and millets received a unique welcome with the millet and organic bouquet from more than a hundred millets. The idea spread through the Heroes Network and through roadshows nationally and globally. Repetition over social networks grew audiences and engagement for the most inclusive global confluence celebration and catalyst. Creating business and conscious consumption opportunities and massive impact. A unique event converging farmers, industries, influencers, consumers and countries. A smarter way forward for a complex problem with a simple message. Let's mill it, go organic. Let's embrace next gen smart food. Yes, so we try to make this pitch, let's millet, go organic, good for the planet, good for the farmers, good for you. So this was the pitch, it's good for the country, our planet, good for us because we are going to eat good food and also for the farmers. Okay, how many of us can identify some of the millets? Let's, let's take a little, what is this one? Yes, sorghum. And which is this one? Pearl millet. <laughs> and which is this one? Rani. Oh, good. We are from here. Karnataka? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> non Karnataka, non Karnataka, Karnataka is good in millets. Yeah, good. This is the, see, see, this is the richest source of calcium among any food that you find. The richest source. Yes, and and other, there are nine, nine different crops, three are called the major millets and these are the minor millets. The little millet, the kodo millet, barnyard millet, proso millet, brown top millet, foxtail millet. Six of minor millets, three of major millets and they form a wonderful range of food and you can actually make anything out of this. They are not very boring old fashioned food. You can also make pizzas out of this. You can make ravioli, you can make lasagna, you can, all kinds of modern foods are possible. So it's not very boring. It's not going back to nature, it's going forward to nature. 
so yeah so they are let they be in your consciousness for some while so maybe you'll keep trying to get them and try in your food and let us also look at what it gives you this is in comparison see finger millet cordo millet proso millet foxtail little barnyard wheat and rice comparison look at this what is the percentage of protein that them all of them give and you will see proso millets has the highest protein content look at crude fiber barnyard miller gives you one of the best crude fibers carbohydrates of course rice gives you a lot <laughs> so you can also see the biggest problem is not hunger obesity is actually a larger problem in the world obesity is a larger problem so and and, and here is the culprit <laughs> somewhere here anyway calcium the the world as i just mentioned any baby food anywhere in the world is is they they switch to ragi for example in india most of the mothers they start feeding ragi to newborn the moment they start having food and also for aging people it's it's a very important uh, thing iron for example barnyard millet and look at how higher than others they are 15 compared to the others phosphorus and mineral matter so the millets gives you a wide range of nutritional benefits they are low on glycemic index you know high glycemic index versus low glycemic index foods especially food good for diabetics and and other uh, problems and india unfortunately the world capital of diabetics my state kerala is actually the capital of diabetes within the country uh, so these are other benefits that it brings you and this with this is my talk over thank you so much for your patient listening Thank you. So, who's going to go home and cook some millet tonight? <laughs> so, are there any questions? Yes, some <laughs> questions, interactions, comments. Please, <laughs> Dr. Sakarya, sir. You can ask me first. Uh, you ask first, and then you okay. uh, Another interesting new movement, at least in the Western world, is the movement towards veganism and vegetarianism. Not very new for India, obviously. Would you say the search for alternate protein sources, millet is a possible answer with a high protein content in some cases? What would you say? Yeah, it's it's also an interesting observation that you've seen vegetarianism and also now vegan. For vegan food, you see, if you look for uh, plants alternative to protein, we have there. Yeah, it will also add to this whole commentary. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Yes. Uh, I have one uh, very nice presentation. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Doctor. Uh, you said that the organic agriculture is safe for carbon dioxide. But I am sorry, microbiologist. I think source and sink are of carbon dioxide. Not only, not only sink. Because once you add organic matter, compost, whatever, Microbes will try to convert quickly and it can take over from the go to the air and rest of them uh, store in the soil, but for, for not for a long time. Is, is there any option when you are taking to request the carbs and carbon dioxide? Well, honestly, I'm not a scientist. I mean, the scientist, right? not a researcher uh, what all i have presented are are papers and references that i can always forward to you it may be the net effect also say for example mulching the the live mulching basically in organic farming what for always farmers have been talking about is to never leave the soil exposed the more the soil is exposed to the sun the more is the release of co2 where you are very right but if you keep on practicing mixed uh, cropping and ensure that the land is covered and then you are also adding um, uh, vermicompost and other composting measures the co2 release will be very less uh, not having release of course is not possible the moment you till a land moment you change a crop that pattern will be there but i think the net effect is that uh, in this kind of farming system 
the CO2 sequestration is much higher than the CO2 release. So, it may be the net. net. But yes, I will, yeah. Um, thank you very much. It's a nice presentation with full of metrics. Thank you, sir. Uh, my question is very general. Now, I'm not working for a fertilizer company. But I strongly support fertilizer for various reasons. You look at the recent episode in Sri Lanka. They stopped fertilizer. Country has gone into pieces, literally. So it is uh, kind of now you talk to any fertilizer company, that's the first thing they will say. You stop fertilizer use, you are in big trouble. Look at what happened in Sri Lanka. You know, they want to com completely change the country into a gun farm. So my question is. I think the definition of organic farming is the most critical one. I can agree with pesticide, you know, overuse of pesticide. To some extent, you can manage with alternatives. But nutrients, I mean, nutrient is the fuel. I mean, the green revolution is all about fertilizer, seeds, of course. So my question to you is, back to your title. Is it organic farming sustainable to sustain food security? Yes. This I'll. I'm not working for any fertilizer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yes. I support organic farming. I support yes. millet. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I am also not working for any organic produce company. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we are on, on an equal platform. But this is an important question that I really want to address. Sri Lanka has become a bad propaganda for organic farming, not because of organic farming, but because of the way Sri Lanka is governed. Let us please understand that Sri Lanka is not going to pieces because of organic farming. I think people are just taking this as an excuse and showing, oh, because there is. Now, tell me one thing. Can any country become organic tomorrow morning by a referendum? or by, by, by an act of law, okay, tomorrow morning we are organic, oh, really? There is no Harry Potter there. No, it, it requires decades of work to make even 10 percent organic, sir. Europe has been working since 1960s and now they are 13 percent, 14 percentage. Sri Lanka was, you know, distraught with two other issues. One, that they ran out of forex they were not able to import fertilizers. They had put their money in the wrong places, they lost a lot of things and now they suddenly said because you cannot buy fertilizers, they said let us go organic. And therefore, you know this is now <laughs> a very bad propaganda, that is one part. Second is a very small state of Sikkim in, in, in India is the first state to become organic. It has only 76,000 hectares and it took 16 years to become 100 percent organic. It started in, um, because we were there when it started off in 2004 and finally in 2018 they became, yeah 14 years or 15 years to become 100 percent organic. It, it requires a process, it requires a regimen change and it also requires farmers to adopt organic farming, not the government legislation. See in, in some, of, some parts of the, uh, my own country we know how politicians work. They can declare for various reasons we do not know, but Sri Lanka is definitely not organic. Let us please uh, you know, understand this. The second part food security etcetera is a debate we can do till the cows come home <laughs> we will have to take more time. There are regions where fertilizers are required, it cannot be changed. For example, India's own Indo-Gangetic plains where our largest rice and wheat is coming from Haryana, Punjab. Western Uttar Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu's rice belt. If I go and ask them to stop fertilizers, I would not even be able to finish my presentation. <laughs> Forget organic farming. <laughs> so, but it will take time and this is a debate. But there are regions like mountainous regions, western guards of the country, Australia's dry farming belt. I think these are good parts to try organic farming and wait for the results. So, this is a you know, balanced uh, view. But Thanks for the clarification. So, what you are saying in Sri Lanka, 
it is the wrong, wrong yes. approach yes. rather than organic press safety. Yes. But the general impression is that they're trying to become overnight, they become yeah. organic, they're banned fertilizer. Yes. So that's the Even you cannot quit smoking in overnight. You cannot stop alcohol overnight, it also requires it. <laughs> How can you stop chemical fertilizers just like that? So, no, no, that's definitely a wrong strategy, sir. Definitely wrong strategy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Oh, you've answered the same okay. question. Thank you. It's a very good question. Yes, yes. So, yes. I'll take your question Yes. You, your name? Uh, myself, I'm Mahantesha Naik. Mahantesha. Mahantesha, okay. Yeah. Yes. And uh, it is known that GM crops, they are mainly focused for reducing of the pesticides yes. and other things. It is all about going for eco-friendly way. Yes. But still it is not considered to be as important. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is also a question always comes. A plant breeder. <laughs> yes, I, I can imagine. But plant breeding is okay. Yeah. I mean, organic farming can accept, is accepting hybridization, traditional hybridization. Genetics and plant breeding are good friends of agriculture. But when it comes to genetic modification of seeds, plants, animals, the, the, the jury is still out. <coughs> the jury is still out. We have, do not have any conclusive evidences of what will be the long term consequences. Just like conventional farming systems long term consequences are now felt after 65 years, we do not want to try do something with manipulation of genetic material and then later after 50, 60 years find that. For example, a, a, farmer, a farmer family in Canada has sued Monsanto and they won the case. Because the, the Monsanto trials outside of their farms have uh, what you call adulterated their native seeds. Because you see the GM crops are not something that you can control. It is also going beyond the fields of trials and fields of uses and, and you know, for example, you know, the, we all agree about biodiversity. Do we all agree on that? That biodiversity is very important even in Australia, lots of people are working on uh, the conservation of biodiversity. The GM contamination can actually cause a lot of havoc in biodiversity. And if we lose out native uh, cultivars, land races, then you are losing a lot of genetic material which has helped this earth survive through the centuries. So that is a debate. Again, I am not a researcher, not a scientist. These are all you know, uh, things that are there in, 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 in the public domain and I will only have to you know, bring to you for this debate. It yeah. is funded by Monsanto. <laughs> 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 Even if you are of good luck. <laughs> <laughs> With the certification, you choose yes or no to certify. Yes. So you can still use the principles without the certification. So that's another element of this. Yes. 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 Did, did you have a question? Oh, yes. Please. Yes. Thanks. I, you, you identified the three. I'm Sri Lankan. The problem was identified right. Oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's like the when, when you have an army guy yep. who thinks turn right, everyone turns right. Yes. Not knowing that bi biological organisms to make compost takes years. Yes. And then to get into the market, the process of certification requires so many years of land yes, sir. being free of fertilizer. So that, but I'm, I'm more coming from the point of marketing uh, because Sri Lankan farmers. The farm holdings are even smaller than India. Very yeah, small. some of them are, yes. But the, uh, everyone is aspirational in wanting to live in an economy that is, that they can have their desires, not like a Western country. So my question is, uh, is it possible to do this in an intensive agriculture? in greenhouses, in, uh, in contained spaces yes. where we can get the market advantage of a higher premium price mm -hmm. premium mm -hmm. 
but at the same time uh, a prop a, a volume advantage yeah. to be derived. So very has that been tried in your sense? Yes, very good, very good question, sir. And uh, what's, what's your name, sir? I'm, I'm Kumar. Kumar. Uh, in fact, uh, I had the opportunity to visit your beautiful country way back in 2009 when Maitripala Sirisena was agriculture minister. And I was invited to make a presentation and help create an organic policy for the country. That time, they never spoke about next day morning going organic. They wanted a long-term roadmap and strategy. And like you said, after 10 years, when uh, different kind of leaders emerged and, you know, Maitri Pala, Sirisena, etc., uh, you know, were, were a different this thing. But, you know, for example, uh, your, your country produces one of the best tea, certified organic tea and they export all over the world. Cinnamon, you are the monopoly of cinnamon, the best of that there are and spices also. You see, uh, green uh, house or poly house cultivation in organic agriculture is quite common and you can produce high value crops in that because the greenhouse polyhouse also helps uh, in preventing uh, pest infestations. And, but in terms of productivity, you see, uh, I, even if I'm coming from agriculture, I, I'll, I'll like to conquer that uh, it cannot beat chemical farming in terms of productivity per acre. It will definitely, you know, be compromised. It's a little bit like a difference between fast food and slow food. What do you want to enjoy? Do you take uh, McDonald's every day? Mm -hmm. Not, I think. So, you know, <laughs> you need to enjoy how the food is produced and should be in the right form. Productivity, I feel, is at least 20 percent or 15 percent lower than other system, but you will get better quality and also better prices. That That is what uh, data shows. Yeah, I hope that answers uh, part of what you yeah, without GMO, if you bring hybrid uh, seeds, please welcome them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, that was a very nice range of questions. Anybody else like to say something? Anyone from this side? Is this uh, globe divided? They are pro organic. They are pro organic. Thank you. <laughs> Anything? Any comments? Any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Sorry, 4 billion? Uh, 4 billion was the number I heard. <coughs> that was from Hungarian and Czech climatologists mm -hmm. talking about hypothetical scenarios if we all went organic. So obviously, where would be the balance of um, organic growing and still using fertilizer? So my question is really, is it scalable? Because Harry Potter came and said, okay. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, scalability, you see, organic farming takes some time. What, what studies show is for a soil to become healthy and like a little self-sustainable, it will require three to four years. So, uh, if a farmer uh, now started uh, decide to switch from a conventional farming system into one of these systems, it has to build the soil fertility levels because uh, long term use of uh, nitrogen fertilizers and other pesticides have, have made the soil. Um, either nutrient wise bad or, or the soil uh, structure has gone bad. So, you have to improve by adding more and more um, plant material, compost, vermicompost and various other uh, traditional methods. It takes time. So, it will take at least about uh, 3 to 4 years for the soil to, to become near at par to a conventional farming system. So, that is what uh, to currently it is scalable, but it will take more time. So everything in balance. Yes, everything in balance. Well, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us for coming and coming to WA and giving your presentation and giving 
what's going on in, in India in a global context, and that's very helpful. So I'd like you to join me in thanking Manoj. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. And just finally, before you run away, the Institute of Agriculture has ongoing programs and seminars, and this is a, a couple coming up, and if you click on the little code, then you can get the full information about the upcoming seminars. But keep an eye on the Institute of Agriculture website, and if you're not connected via your email to the, the seminar notices, then you can contact the Institute of Agriculture to get onto their mailing list. So thank you for coming, and thank you for all of those who are listening off, off air at the moment. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your patient listening, for the questions, very enriching questions. This will also help us prepare more for the, any next round of, of this kind of you know, uh, interesting debate.